1 Corinthians 16 is where we are this morning in the scriptures, and uh, we're in the last week, chapter 16, the end of, of uh, Welcome to My Messy Life, and so this goes away all together now. Oh. Haven't you enjoyed this? Yeah, did you like the lights in it? I saw, I thought I saw a rabbit chasing a, a dog in the, the kind of the new art. Have you seen messages inside of clouds? I see them inside of bent rebar. So, um, this has really been cool, but it does, it does give a great picture of just how messed up life can really be. And um, so, um, you're in First Corinthians 16. How many of you have been here? It, you, this is an eight-week series. How many of you have at least gotten to hear four of the messages uh, during this? Yeah, you've come back. This is good. Um, how many of you, uh, this, like, uh, for you, it seems like it's been a, a 36-week course. It's been so messy. Yeah, it's about right. So, First Corinthians chapter 16. Life is so messy, and when you come to Christ and he forgives you of your sin, gets you ready for heaven, that's a good thing. But we're still dealing with the mess. Just because we're headed to heaven doesn't mean all the mess is fixed. And, and there, is a, there is a theology out there that isn't a good one. And that theology says, come to Jesus and he solves every problem of your life. And, and the people who say that, those people have not read 1 Corinthians. They, don't, they, don't read, they haven't read 2 Corinthians or Philippians or Ephesians. They, they do not understand because the reality is life continues to be messy all the way up until you arrive into heaven and then all of a sudden it will make sense it will all come into order and so um i wanted to i wanted to just close out this series by by um reviewing a little bit because what happened in first Corinthians is this we know life is messy paul writes to address some messes but he sees within the messes uh, they also asked him some questions. But they had messes like divisions and quarreling, immaturity. The divisions were so bad it was going to kill the work of the Lord. The immaturity was so bad it was, they were going to like bite and devour each other is what he would say in Galatians. It was, there was immorality and drunkenness and lawsuits all within this church. Marriage and singleness, they couldn't figure that out. They had questions about what food they could eat and idolatry. And they were trying to honor God, but they didn't know how to, that was going to happen. They were conflicted in their worship, and sometimes they weren't sure about what their worship was doing more harm than good. And so the Apostle Paul writes to correct some of that, but then he also writes to answer some of the questions. And one of the questions that they had is, probably, is what about the giving? I mean, we're supposed to be giving to this church in Jerusalem. It was in trouble because of a famine and because people had been fired. And they want to give as a church to the church and then to provide for another church. Oh, what do we do and, and when and where and how and why and how much? It, lots of questions probably. And so that's what chapter 16, the first four verses are about. Now in your bulletin, you're going to find a couple of inserts. One is this. This is a little brochure called Giving by the Book. I, we've inserted that for you. This gives you an overview of giving throughout, kind of a panned overview of the scriptures, of what the scriptures say about giving. And then there's also some bulletin insert notes because I'm, I'm going to refer to these as we go through First Corinthians 16. So I just encourage you to take notes. But I also want to encourage you with a couple of books. Um, one is called Generosity, and we happen to have a few copies of this book, Generosity, here by Gordon McDonald. If you'd like it, if you've never ha had a copy and you, you, you'd be willing to read it, you're more than welcome to just come up at the end of service and grab a copy. Uh, there's another book I don't have copies of. If I did, I'd be willing to give them to you called The Treasure Prin Principle by Randy Alcorn. Randy Alcorn is, for me, one of the favorite authors. He's written another book called Heaven. If you've not read that, you need to read it. It is the Bible on heaven. That's a joke, okay? Heaven's in the Bible. But he, he explains heaven maybe more thoroughly than anybody else. Uh, it's called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Another book called The Treasure Principle. And this one is just on giving and creating a generous heart and the, your own treasure of your own heart. Um, he's a wonderful writer, uh, just a great guy as a person. Uh, I recommend that book as well. Um, but okay, so maybe you've had questions about giving. Like, okay, we pass an offering uh, basket every week. I don't understand the back of the bulletin. You know, last week our budget was 21000 We gave 20000 I don't know what that means. I, you know, next week we give fourteen or fifteen thousand. Next week it's twenty-one thousand. You, you have no idea who's doing what or what that goes towards. 
I can't answer all those questions, but what I can do is answer seven questions from the passage. You ready? Here we go. Here are seven great uh, questions that are going to be answered. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now about the collection of the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so when I come, uh, no collections will have to be made. Verse 3. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them um, with the gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to, also, to go also, they will accompany me. Okay, that's verses one to, uh, one to four. There are, let me give you seven kind of, of, of nuggets here out of the passage. One is, the first one is the purpose of giving. Go back to verse one. Now the collection for the Lord's people. The purpose of giving is to give, not just to the church, this is for the Lord's people. This is for the saints, the Christian body of believers. Specifically, it's gonna go to the believers in Jerusalem, as we know by this context. There had been a famine, a number of the people had lost their jobs becoming followers of Jesus. They were down and down and out, basically, and so they're helping other Christians in another church. This is the support of general ministry, and that's what we do. When we collect funds, it just supports the general ministry. And it, as the work of the Lord advances with his people, it, it is among his people, not just for his people, but among his people. And this isn't just for the church in Corinth. He says, do what I told the Galatian churches to do, which were actually a half a dozen other churches in what we would call modern-day Turkey today. He's saying, do what I told Galatia to do, which, in other words, is this is good for all churches to do. It's a broad, sweeping directive concerning the collection for God's people. Now, here's number two, the period of giving. When should you give? He says, on the first day of the week, verse 2. It's, it tells us that giving is a part of worship. By the way, if you didn't notice, Old Testament days they worshiped on Saturday, last day of the week. When Jesus Christ rose on the first day of the week, most Christians immediately began to worship on what they call Resurrection Day. It became Sunday. I don't know if you knew that or not. But that's why it is. And sometimes people refer to the Sabbath. That was actually a Saturday. How many of you grew up using the word Sabbath? Yeah, eight of us. Okay. I had a grandpa. He referred to Sunday as Sabbath. Yeah, it's my Sabbath day. And what that meant to him was it was his day off. But, but that would always be a Sunday. But in Old Testament days, it was actually Saturday. He's saying on the first day of every week, when you gather together, this is happening within the context of a church. It tells us it's a priority. It's the first thing you do in the week. You start your week by giving to the Lord. It's not just when you want to or when the Spirit prompts you or when you feel the need or occasionally. No, it needs to be every weekend. And why is that? Because we need the regular reminder that all good gifts come from above. We need to not be legalistic about it, but we need to have a regular plan to not only support the ministry, but to also recognize that all of the gifts, all the good things that come, come from the hand of a good God who's in heaven. It's one of the reasons that you need to say thanks over a meal. It's just as simple as a meal. When you say thanks, God, we're grateful for our jobs, for the meal of the day. Not everybody gets this. It's just a constant reminder, not legalistic, not something you absolutely have to do, but something that's a constant reminder, so the first day of the week. And also what happens too is this. When you give uh, every week, what happens is it raises the sensitivity to say, is my heart bent towards heaven? As I give, that's where my treasure is, that's where my heart will be. Is my heart bent towards heaven? Every seven days, ask yourself that. Thirdly, you have the purpose of giving and the period of giving. Thirdly, now the participants. On the first day of every week, each one of you. Isn't it amazing how clear the Bible is? Each one of you. Each one. Not just all of you, but each one of you. Okay? Um, when I was growing up, I'd be in the kitchen, I'd be walking through the kitchen on the way to the garage to get my bike, go down the street. And my mom would say, I think we need to take the trash out. What was the we about this? <laughs> there was no we about this, right? And she didn't hold my hand and we carried trash out together. No, she's saying, Dave, take, it, tr take the trash out. And so we did. Uh, sometimes we, we talk about it, it in terms of this is what we want to do, but really what we mean is you do. 
The Apostle Paul says, no, this is something that we do, and not just we as a group, but each one of us. So it is, it's personal. Get this. It's not something that other people do and you watch. No, it's something that we do, and it's each one of you. Not just all of us, but each one of us. It's very personal before God. Um, and, and, and why is that? It's because... Each of us needs to experience the step of faith. Each of us needs to know that our source is from God. Each of us needs to know that we're making a contribution that's something bigger, something greater, something grander, something that's going to last for eternity. Each one of us needs to, to turn and take the treasure and put it towards heaven. Each one of us needs to know the joy of actually giving for something that will outlive itself, that will, that will last forever, forever. Yeah. It's like prayer. It's not just good for some people. It's good for all of us. All of us need the, it's like grace. All of us need to extend grace. Why? It's good for us because it helps us remember the salvation, the grace that was ours. So the participants are in giving are each one of you. Now, number four, here's the place of giving. Uh, go back to verse two again. On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that no collections, that means it's already collected, will have to be made. Get that? So no collections will have to be made. So in other words, this is the first day of the week. You're going to church already. You gathered for worship. You go ahead and collect the money. This is a day of celebration. You set aside a sum of money so it's not an emotional appeal. It's, this is planned giving, and it's collected at the assembly. So when their need arises, the money is already collected. Do you get that from the text? It's already collected, so no collections have to be made. It's already there. It's like storehousing it. So it's planned, regular, and that it minimizes the emergency kind of thing that it could happen if you don't do that. So the place of giving, obviously the church. Number five, the proportion of giving. Again, verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money, and what's it say? In keeping with your income. In keeping with your income. The answer is take a portion of your income, a portion of your hard-earned cash, and put it towards the Lord's work. Why? Between you and the Lord, you establish what that sum ought to be, and that ought to be honorable and ought to be worshipped. It needs, it needs to meet the needs of, of the ministry, but each of us does this. I'm always amazed. You're, you're taking notes. I'm always amazed. People will tell me all the time, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. And then once they hand money into the church, then they go, make sure you tell them to give. Okay, were you the same guy who just said, don't tell me what to do? Yeah, now you're telling, oh, yeah, but don't tell me what to do. Tell them what to do. It's always someone else. And and my word to you is this, have the Lord tell you what to do. Each of you set aside a sum of money. In fact, it, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I try to stay in 1 Corinthians, but there's so much about giving. Other places. But he says, you, you need to set aside a sum of money, and it needs to be from your heart. 2 Corinthians uh, 9, 7. Give what you decided to give from your heart, and not reluctantly, not under compulsion. Why? Because God, he's not even looking at the sum. He wants a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You're saying, you've got to be kidding me. It's painful when I write a check. Yeah, and so that's your prayer. Lord, move this from pain to joy when I give. Help me to see this makes a difference, really a difference. Have you ever had a, a like you buy a, maybe it's a suit of clothes, it could be a shirt or a blouse or a dress or, or a pair of pants or something, but to you it's brand new, but you've been wearing it now for a couple years, but in your mind it's still new. You know what I'm talking about? And someone goes, well, that's kind of, it's worn well for as old as it is. And you go, but it's, in your mind it's still new. Anybody else have this? We have some furniture in our house that is that way. My wife says, I, I say the new couch. She goes, you do know it's 15 years old, right? Yeah, but it's still the new couch. I want to treat it like it's new. She says, we can take the plastic off now, Dave. It's 15 years. No, she didn't say it. But to you, it's still new, right? Have you ever done this? You go in a store. Maybe it's, maybe it's a shirt. I'll just do a shirt because that's what I have on right now. And, and uh, all God's people said, amen. Okay, good. So you're in a store, 
and you see a shirt and you go, my shirt looks nice and then you get up next to a new shirt and you go this tattered this is oh my gosh I can't believe I'm in public like this have you ever been that way where you just oh my word or you look at your shoes have you ever done this gone in to get some shoes and, oh, I had no I would have shined the old ones up to save my dignity even though I'm buying new ones just because you didn't realize how bad the others you know understand this Everything about your life that you buy, that you consume, eventually gets old and wears out and lands in the dumpster at the curb, right? Right, and hopefully it lands there sometime after you've been making payments on it. Hopefully you haven't dumped it. Oh yeah, we still have three payments on that thing, okay? Hopefully you're staying ahead of the curve in your cash. But understand the nature of the world system is for stuff to wear out, not to get better. Okay, when you give with eternity in mind, you're actually giving to something that will never fade, never wear out. Why? Because you're giving towards heaven. I hope you get this. So your investment will never ever fade on you. It'll never go bad on you. Okay, so the place of giving is the church. The proportion of giving, number five, is is what you have determined in your heart. Second Corinthians nine seven but in keeping with your income. By the way, Old Testament term, tithe. Abram tithe. Go back and read it. He didn't tithe a tenth of what he made. He tithe the tenth of what he had. I hope you get the difference. <laughs> that was some monster offering that day. Now, he only did it once that we know of. He may have done it again. But understand this. I, there are moments in your life that you may give a monster gift you get an endowment or someone in your family dies and they leave you a mon- bunch of money and you, you're going to give. In the book of Acts, there's a story of some guys who, who sold a house and they just they gave all the money or a piece of property they gave at farmland, which would be a monster amount of money and they threw the money at the feet of the disciples. You come across great money like this, nothing better than go, you know what, I, I know that if I keep this, I'm going to get in trouble with it. I'm going to give it away. You know that one of my favorite, all-time favorite guys is uh, Rick Warren. He's written a couple of best-selling books. He's a great pastor, good guy. And he wrote a book. They gave him a lot of money. He went home and told his wife, Kay, I, uh, this is a lot of money. If I keep this, money, it's going to ruin us. And, and you could just imagine Kay's like out shopping cars and stuff right now. <laughs> Let's spend this stuff. She goes, you're right. It is. It's going to ruin us. So he devised a method to give it away as quickly as he could. Isn't that crazy? A major magazine went to do an interview on Rick Warren. And uh, it's, a national, it's a nationally published magazine. And so they, they had set this appointment. They're going to interview him at the Saddleback Church office in Mission Viejo, California, where he ministers. But what they didn't tell him was they arrived early for the interview. They came a day or two early. And they drove around town. And you know what they looked for? They looked for what he was driving and where he lived and what his lifestyle was. And he was in the same house, living with the same woman, driving the same car. Okay? And that was like the end of the interview already. They hadn't even interviewed him because they knew his heart. Wouldn't that be cool if that were us? How cool. Um, Okay, enough of that. Don't feel the need either. Um, Just a caution uh, to announce your gifts. You, you don't have to. Um, Mark chapter 12, Jesus tells, uh, well, actually Mark writes the story that Jesus is a part of. But Jesus sits outside the temple one day and uh, in that day they actually gave their boxes. They, we think their boxes on the wall. People put their coins in a container. And they actually would give, in the Old Testament, they would actually give a, a tenth of spices, a, t- a tenth of a crop, because it was very agrarian, very agriculturally driven. In, in this day, they were just using coins, and there was a box to drop the coins, and people were dropping their money, and it was a big boo-ha-ha. And then a widow walks by, and she just drops in the few things she has, and Jesus says, see that? That's the gift right there. So you may think, it, again, it doesn't matter if I give or not. No, that widow gave not out of her riches, but out of her poverty, she gave something that really meant something to her. And that, that's really what worship is. And he said her gift is better than the others. Mark chapter 12. 
And don't feel the need to ever announce it. Uh, Acts chapter 5 um, is a great reminder. There are people who, who gave and, and then others who gave because they wanted others to see. And uh, just write down the names, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they gave so people would see, and the, and, and the apostles said, who deceived your heart? What's going on? And they died. They, they dropped dead. And so when you set an amount, uh, ask yourself questions like this. Okay, Lord, I'm going to give to you. Here's the proportion piece. I'm going to give to you. How can I honor you with my worship? How can I... Uh, does this gift I'm going to give, does it require sacrifice? Am I going to have to adjust my lifestyle? Will this cost me something? Ask yourself the question, God, am I cheerful in my giving? Because if I'm not, help me, Lord, to become cheerful. And then, and then and that, another great question to ask yourself is this one. God, am I giving you money so I don't have to give you myself? Okay? Have you ever paid for someone to do something for you so you don't have to do it? Yeah. You, you pay someone else to do something so you don't have to do it. Well, okay, I'll give him money and he'll get off my back. No, that's not what he wants. He wants your heart and money is one of those ways to it, but this ought to be a part of us giving of ourselves to the Lord. Okay, that's the proportion piece. And by the way, well, how much of a proportion does the Lord want of you? He wants 100% of you. Okay? All right, enough of proportion. Now the protection in giving. Chapter 16, verse 3. Then when I arrive, Paul writes, I'll give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. He says, when I arrive, I'll give letters. That's the protection. So multiple hands are going to be on this, and you can expect these funds to be handled legitimately and respectably and honorably because we know they are a gift to the Lord's work. Get this? So there's accountability is good and reverence is good. You never want to give, by the way, where there's no little to no accountability. You never want to give when you're not sure, when you're not sure it's going to work out. You, you don't want to give when you can't get some kind of accountability to the funding. And because what's going to happen is if that were to happen and you get burned, then trust is broken. And when trust is broken, then you don't want to give at all. See, so you want to make sure you give to trustworthy organizations. So that's the protection in giving. One more, and it's the process of giving. He says in verse 4, if it seems advisable to me also, they'll accompany me. He says, I'll go, and, and uh, these guys will go with me. In other words, he's saying, I'll take the money, and get this, this we read by, by these verses like they're nothing. But for him to say, I'll go with the delivery of the money, means I know for you this is sacrificial giving, therefore I will sacrifice, and I'll make sure it gets there. That's one. It's not just time. It's his safety. He's on the road with a bag of gold. He's a mugging waiting to happen. You don't have to go back many years. Go back 150 years in the United States. Trains that ran across the country that had gold were a holdup waiting to happen, right? I mean, we, we know this. In that day, traveling with large amounts of cash had all kinds of signs written on it. He is saying, I believe in your gift and I want these people to have it so much I'm willing to take the risk even though my life is threatened by it. So getting those funds when you, once you collect them, the process of giving, make sure you pray for the process. Once you hand money in, we, we collect the offering, we've done that already, and it gets counted and banked. Pray for the people, pray for the ministry, pray for the distribution, pray for safety, pray for great effective ministry because the process is really just engaged. Just as soon as you give, you are letting it go. But now, now the ministry really happens. And, and so once you give, then, then, then crank up the prayers. But what you give is going to fuel the ministry and do it well. Now, I, I'm done. I'm done. I just want to tell you this. You've done great to get through First Corinthians with me. But I, the ending verses, we don't have time to hit them all. But I want you to see something that I, I can't let go. The Apostle Paul ends, and he's instructed. He, there's been a lot of, of there's been a, a lot of chaos, a lot of mess, and yet when he concludes, verse five, he says, "I will come to you. I'm still your friend. I will stay with you a while." Verse six, he mentions verse ten, Timothy. Verse twelve, Apollos. Verse fifteen, Stephanus. And again, those who are devoted to the Lord. Understand this. This is where his real treasure is. It's in the people next to Jesus. 
His real treasure is with the people. And the list continues, and he says, in verses 16, 17, he says, these people refresh my heart and your spirit as well. I leave you with these words. Be, next to Jesus, the real riches are the relationships that you're going to enjoy. That's where the real riches are. So, in the ministry, be on guard. Verse 13, stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, but make sure you do everything in love. And then he concludes, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And by the way, I know it's been a mess, but I want you to know, last words, and these are the lasting, last words are the ones you remember, right? My love to you all in, in Christ Jesus, amen. He concludes by saying, I love you. I know it's a mess. And when we get to heaven, it'll all be figured out. But in the meantime, don't ever doubt that I love you. Would you bow with me in prayer? So, Father in heaven, it would be easy for us to walk away and go, this is a message about money. And really, it's not. It's really about our hearts and the treasure that is within us because Christ is in us. May we treasure him this week and live in a way that would honor him. May we be the people who are on guard and stand firm. May we be courageous and strong. And may we do everything we pray in love. And may the people in my hearing right now, may we be the ones who carry the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ into the community this week. And may we be the most loving people in the world because we are certainly loved. We pray this in the matchless name of Christ our Savior and the power of your spirit. God's people would say amen.